Fewer and fewer among us read poetry, and those who do, like yours truly, are considered somewhat romantic. But this was simply not the case for perhaps the most hardened and effective soldiers the ancient world would ever produce, the Spartans. For Cronos' son, Zeus himself, husband to fair-crowned Hera, gave this city to the sons of Heracles, with whom we came into the island of Pelops, leaving behind us windy Erineus. Whether you believe in what's usually called the Indo-European invasion, the theory that traces European cultures to an ancestral one that came from the north, or whether you don't, it's worth remembering that the Spartans sure did, and they always considered themselves invaders in their own lands, the island of Pelops, as the poem called the Peloponnese, the peninsula in the south of Greece. But even those who, like the Spartans themselves, do believe in this Indo-European invasion theory, often forget that two were the main human types that these steppe nomads brought down as they moved into Europe. The first, of course, is the warrior, the type that would eventually be exalted in Homer's first epic, the Iliad, and of which Hector, Achilles, Ajax and Odysseus were prime examples. The second, however, is the poet himself, of which Homer was one of the first, and some would say best, example. It was around the time that Europe was taking its final shape, sometime around the 10th century BC, the so-called Dark Ages of Antiquity, that the poet emerged as a cultural figure of unparalleled force carrying the values of his culture during a time when writing was all but forgotten, until he became the highest paid profession of his time. But in contrast to its importance for old Europe, in modern times poetry is in rapid decline and soon might become a minor or rather quirky pastime, like ice skating. But the Greeks made no mistake Poets, they said, were the metal workers of the human soul, and they believed that our very consciousness is shaped by the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. In this, the Spartans were no different, and they too traced their own culture not to some mighty warlord, but to a poet, Pirteos, who fashioned the Spartan soul out of his verses. When out in the field, the Spartans would sing the poets' battle hymns as they marched, while in the evening, they would compete among each other in reciting his verses, with the army's general acting as judge, awarding extra food rations to the victor. Tirteo's birth and early life are shrouded in mystery, with many historical accounts now considered a fiction. The geographer Pafsanias told how, when the Spartans were fighting to regain control of their peninsula, they received an omen from the oracle of Delphi that told them to send emissaries to Athens and ask for a wise man to be sent from that city. They fetched a schoolteacher, Tirteos, whom Pausanias describes as lame on one leg and slow of mind. This story seems to suggest that Athens' worst became Sparta's best, and so it has been doubted by modern historians for its obvious Athenian bias. Yet, the timing that is alluded by this myth reveals something important. Estirteo's poetry was probably conceived during an age of intense fighting, the Second Messenian War of the 7th century BC. It was a time when the Spartans fought to regain the rich province they had acquired in the West some two generations before, and some of Tirteo's verses are telling of how important this particular period was for the Spartans. 
It is a noble thing for a brave man to die, falling in the front ranks, doing battle for the fatherland, but for a man to forsake his city and his rich fields and to go begging is of all things the most grievous. As he wanders with his dear mother and his aged father, with his small children and his lawful wedded wife, for he is hated by those among whom he goes as a beggar, yielding to need and loathsome poverty. Tirteos, like every other poet of ancient Greece, owed his art to one who will forever rank as the greatest, Homer, composer of the two great epics, Iliad and Odyssey, that became for the Greeks a kind of secular Bible. But despite his debt, there is something unique that made Tirteos so important for Sparta. See, in his first epic, the Iliad, just as portrayed in Hollywood's Troy, Homer gave us an Achilles who is brave, but also reckless, selfish and arrogant, stubbornly refusing to fight for his compatriots because of a personal insult over a woman. The image of the lone ranger who bows to no man and fights single duels like a Western cowboy might have been appropriate for the Bronze Age warrior who wandered in roaming bands across the countryside searching for glory. But as the Greeks began to civilize, they also began to fight in a different way altogether. The phalanx, the tight formation of heavily armored shock troops that moved in unison, each protecting the man on his left while being protected by the man on his right through their oplon, the shield. It was this, this new type of warrior, the hoplite, that Tirteos would exalt. And while Homer begins his epic with an invocation for the memory of Achilles, the swift-footed warrior, Tirteos responds to this verse by singing, I would not call to mind a man, nor relate a tale of him, nor for the speed of his feet, nor for his wrestling skill. Not if he possessed the stature and force of a cyclops and could outpace Boreas, the north wind of Thrace. Instead, what Tirteus managed with his poetry was to turn the Homeric stereotype around from the single duels described so well in the Iliad into the communal way of fighting inside of the phalanx, the way that Spartans would eventually excel over all cities in ancient Greece. For no one ever becomes a man good in war unless he has endured the sight of the blood and slaughter, stood near and lunged for the foe. This is virtue, the finest prize achieved among humankind. This is a common good shared by the entire city and people. When a man stands his ground, remains in the front ranks. The ranks of the phalanx and the new virtue that Tirteo sings for is civil courage, which included the willingness of a warrior to subordinate his will to a common good, greater than himself, something that can hardly be imagined by a hero like Achilles. The glory that these early warriors craved for, the Homeric Cleos, was from now on to become the public memory guaranteed by the city itself, Sparta. Every year, and while ordinary soldiers were buried in the way they lived, wrapped only in the purple cloak worn by Spartans in battle, their champions would be treated almost like demigods in what can only be described as the city's hero cults. His tomb and his children will be noted among humankind and the children of his children and his lineage after them. Never will his shining glory perish and never his name. For he will be an immortal, though under the earth, the man who excels all others in standing his ground in the fight. For his children and land, he whom the raging war god destroys. 
The Spartan committed those and many other of Tyrtaeus' verses to memory, reciting them around their campfires as they richly combed their long hair and putting on their cloak of royal purple that so terrified their foes. On the day of battle, and just like the wine they would drink, so the verses of Tyrtaeus resonated in the heavy air of the battlefield. Plutarch said that the Spartan king would sacrifice to the muses before each battle, as if he were a poet himself, reminding his soldiers that this is the day they can do the deeds that will make their names be remembered forever. It's fashionable these days when interpreting history to discount the importance of everything that does not conform to material causation, to everything that does not help us explain events in terms of natural resources, commercial route, germs, or new technologies. But the Spartans thought differently, and for all their physical toughness and practicality of mind, they never had doubts about the importance of poetry in the direction of their culture. And as for us, trapped in a materialist mindset, we actually fall easy victims to the influence of music and poetry. As a new kind of music arose during the 1960s, rock and roll, post-war Europe did not have the Spartan wisdom to understand exactly what that meant for its culture. The premature ecstasy that rock offered its youth, very much like the drugs that accompanied its rhythms, could not but have led to the nihilism that we experience today.